It's been quite some time, hasn't it? Pretty sure last time I posted, it was right before the summer of 2020. Well, it's now 2021, time for another update. What is going on everybody? I hope you're having a good day and I wanted to post this video to just give an update on what's going on. So before I dive into what's actually going on, the reason why I haven't been posting is as we all know, 2020, it was absolutely crazy. In case you were unaware, my full-time job is actually a drummer and an educator. And with everybody shifting to remote, my whole world was turned upside down. Now, I don't want you to take that as if it's a bad thing. I love what I do. I wake up every day and teach drums or play drums and that's how I make a living. I also have a YouTube channel for my profession, so I'll make sure that I put a link down below. Maybe I'll put something up here or over here, wherever it goes on YouTube for you to check out if you'd like to. So besides switching over to remote learning, my wife gave birth to our first kid back in July. As far as family life is concerned, everything is good. Wife is healthy, kid is healthy. The crazy part is actually having a kid during a pandemic when you can't rely on family members. I mean, I even consider myself lucky that they even let me in the hospital while she was giving birth. Luckily, I was able to be there and then my wife and I just had to be that team that we are to make sure that we could take care of a newborn, especially when we don't really know what we were doing. So those are just a couple things that were going on since the last posts. Speaking of posts, the last performance video that I uploaded was when we took the car to Cecil County Dragway. If you watched that video, you are aware that the fastest time was 14.7 at 107 miles an hour. Big turbo with stage two cams and forged internals and full bolt-ons, that is terrible. But as everybody knows, when you do a build that is that thorough, it never goes off without a hitch. There are always problems that you have to iron out and tweak and adjust to get it to where you want it to be. So that test and tune was step one in actually seeing how this car would perform. Now, while we were at that test and tune, I was messaging a few HHR friends to try and figure out ways to adjust the tune on the fly. One of which was Matthew Clevenstein. If you are unaware of Matt, you know his black and copper striped HHR. He currently holds the record for the fastest automatic HHR. I was also talking to Shane Hetfield. He is the one who installed the transmission tune on the car. I was also talking to Bernie, who is in the process of building a monster HHR. Now the one thing is, is that both Matt and Bernie are tuned by the same tuner. They got me in contact with James Rakes and I've been working on tuning this car with him ever since. Now I want to make one thing perfectly clear. I have no bad blood with ZZ Performance. They have been nothing but supportive and helped me get the parts that I need to get this build put together. Now, yes, they are the ones who originally remote tuned this car, but also keep in mind that I took this car to Fon's performance and dyno tuned it. Now, everything that we adjusted with that dyno tune falls on me and Fon's. It has nothing to do with ZZ performance. So as far as this car not running right, it all falls on me and I'll totally take the blame on that. I am not going to stand here and blame ZZ performance. They did nothing wrong. I will say this, however, after talking to Matt, who currently holds the record for the fastest automatic HHR, and Bernie, who are both tuned by James, you also have to realize that James has been tuning all of the configurations that Rob Shoemate has put into his monster HHR. To me, it just made sense to reach out to James and have him remote tune this thing. So believe it or not, James has been pointing out a few things that were wrong with this build that we've had to fix. For example, that little black plastic boost reserve on the front of the engine, yeah, we had to get rid of that. Now it's labeled as a boost reserve because GM says it keeps excess vacuum because if you're in high boost situations, you're gonna need it to be able to brake. Really what it is, with this LNF configuration, if you go with any of the rear wheel drive cars that have the same setup, it doesn't have it. As soon as they put it in the front wheel drive cars, they put that on it because they were afraid people would complain about torque oversteer. What that thing actually does is it delays boost. And as you all saw at those test and tunes, this car is bogged beyond belief out of the chute. No. 
So what we had to do is actually bypass that altogether. Another crazy thing that he pointed out is that my knock sensors were actually in the wrong position. Something we did not know when we were putting everything back together, but the pigtails on those knock sensors should be at the nine o'clock position. We had them pointing straight down, which means that they are going to react a whole lot differently. This could produce false knock, which then in return reduces power, which again can delay spooling. Another issue we ran into is that we were splicing the vacuum line to the intake manifold one too many times and it was causing some issues. So what I ended up getting was a small vacuum manifold so that way I have one vacuum line connected to the intake manifold and then I can connect everything that needs vacuum to that. But wait, there's more. Ever since we put this car back together, one thing I would notice is that if I went under the car to take a look at anything, I would always notice a little bead of oil by the oil drain plug. At first I thought it was because the drain plug wasn't tight, but then once I noticed that it was always happening, I realized there was a bigger problem. Turns out we installed that oil line that goes from the turbo back into the engine incorrectly. The way that we had it set up, it seems like it was starting to kink the line. So under pressure, oil would just spit out the top of the line. It eventually would end up on the block and then slowly start to drip its way down. So that's another thing that we have to fix. I also ended up installing a catch can on the car between cylinders two and three. Now you're gonna hear from a bunch of people saying catch cans are a waste, they don't work on the LNF, but keep in mind I am running a TTR manifold and I have an external PCV valve. Also, if you take a look at this photo, you can see it's actually catching a lot of stuff. Now one day as I was logging the car for James, right when I was about to put it away, I noticed a little puddle right by the back left tire. Yep. The fuel lines completely rotted out in this car. I was actually going to make a video on how to replace rotted lines because it is so common with this car. After shooting all of the footage, I went to go edit it and halfway through, I said to myself, this is terrible. So I ended up throwing it in the trash. I also made a video showing all of you that I got rid of my daily driver and got another Ecotec. Once again, as I was editing the video, I said to myself, it's not really that good. Deleted that too. But I ended up getting rid of that Focus ST as my daily driver and got a 2020 Equinox with the LTG 2.0 turbo motor. Crazy thing about it is that on paper, it has the same horsepower rating as a Focus ST. The difference is, is that it's an SUV, the torque rating is 260, and it's all wheel drive. So now, where are we? Let's take a look. As you can see, there is no valve cover on the car. But if you take a look, everything's clean. It looks good. The reason why there is no valve cover is because that AN fitting that we tapped on the back left corner is actually leaking. From time to time, I will notice a little trail of oil that runs down from the bottom of that fitting. So I took that valve cover off and sent it over to a buddy of mine who is currently welding an AN fitting in place to help get rid of that. Now that's a major thing I want to get done because of the fact that as I'm remote tuning with James, I cannot get this car to boost past 23 pounds. After sending logs back and forth and having James keep telling me that there was a boost leak, I finally had to listen to him and go hunt for this boost leak. So besides checking all the vacuum lines to make sure that they're good, that fitting on the back leaking oil could be part of the problem. Luckily, since we are in January and we are in Southeast Pennsylvania, might as well take care of it now. While we're here, we might as well take a look at the catch can setup. Like I said, I am running the TTR manifold and I have a tap between cylinders two and three. You can see that I have a line running from there. It goes over to where my PCV valve is in an external housing, runs into a catch can over here on the side, and then I have a line that runs from the can to right there, the front of the intake manifold. This allows me to still have that PCV functionality with an aftermarket manifold. So as you can see, there has been a lot going on, but instead of just posting a new video with each issue, I figured I'll just send one big old update. So the first thing is, fix the boost leak on the car, continue logging it with James and really get this car working. Once that is done, it'll be time to move on to the next project on the car, which is going to be a 100% complete overhaul of a specific category. So that is it. Sorry that this video isn't too entertaining, but just to give you that quick update, I hope you're all doing well and surviving this crazy pandemic. For those of you who have an off season because of the winter, I hope you guys are having success with your builds and everything else that you're doing. And until next time, see you later.